Hi, I'm Garnbreak1, and this is Midgardia's Cool Crowdfunding Show. I'm here today with John Hambo McGuire. How's it going? I'm great, man. Thank you so much for having me on the show today. I'm glad to have you on. So, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about Point Nemo? So, Point Nemo is the latest adventure from 321 Action. 321 Action is an storytelling, cinematic storytelling RPG. Uh, rule set that I wrote with my best friend George. Uh, he is also the co-writer of Point Nemo. Point Nemo takes place on a mysterious island in the middle of nowhere, full of intrigue, mystery, monsters. Uh, you are brought there by a billionaire under false pretense uh, as a documentary film crew, and wackiness ensues. As you do, as you do. The the classic uh, the classic billionaire ploy, the plot of many a classic pulp action movie. Oh, yeah. Or it's like, oh, yeah, we're going here to shoot a documentary uh, about, like, what's happening under the water. It's all above board, and then you shipwreck, and then there's monsters. <laughs> you said Monster Island was, uh, was a misnomer. It's actually a peninsula. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 100%. That's right on the money. Yeah. So, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about 3, 2, 1, Action? So 3, 2, 1, Action is, you know... It's a cinematic storytelling RPG. It's meant to be a very low barrier to entry so everyone can feel comfortable playing RPGs. Uh, it runs off a single D10. Uh, all your bonuses or penalties are based off a of one, two, three. The game runner, who is the person who runs the show, you tell the game runner what you want to do and you make it so with just one roll. And so you'll roll either at or below your stats. And if you're in the process of doing something that might be outside of your comfort zone, you know, as a character, like, say, I don't know, for instance, swinging on a jungle vine over a pit of lava, um, instead of just rolling to see if you can do it, you could fill the plot hole in two sentences. And this is something that the game runner is going to ask you to do. And it's one of the main mechanics of 3 2 1 action, which is, you know, I'm the game runner. You're going to try to jump on this vine and swing over this lava. I'll be like, all right, we'll make an action check, which is the main stat, uh, plus two, which means now. You have to add two to your roll and still try to roll below, at or below your stat. Or you could fill the plot hole in two sentences and say something like, you know, when I was a kid, I was the only kid who was able to climb the rope in gym class. And that's it. No more penalty. I might even give you a bonus depending on how everyone at the table reacts and pops to your answer. So we really try to keep it simple and easy for people to really just lose themselves and actually having the experience of playing rather than trying to crunch rules and numbers. Right, so it's very much a, a narrativist kind of uh, genre emulation game. Yeah, absolutely. Right on. That's uh, that is one of my favorite genres of game. Also, giant fish monsters. I see. I love giant fish monsters. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of that in the game, and honestly, like, I don't think there's any wrong way to play a game. I think that if you like crunchy rules and that is what you're all about, if you're having fun with it, I'm excited for you. If you like want something to be like, I want to. Roll a D6 as a bear and wear a hat, uh, like in Honey Heist. I think that there's so much merit to that as well. It's all about getting people to the table and letting the people you're playing with and yourself have as much fun as you can doing the thing that you want to do. So 3 to an Action really for me was all about, uh, during the early phase of the pandemic, I was playing a lot of different games with a lot of different people online and a lot of first-time gamers. And I kind of mentally took note of the hurdles that they were experiencing trying to learn different rule sets and play different styles of games and i wanted to create something with my my best friend george and my co co-pilot on this whole thing where anyone who picks up this book i know it seems like a broad generalization but if you pick up the book you can read it you get really just if you don't read it cover to cover you get the broad strokes enough to sit at a table and have a great party with your friends yeah like i i, I have the pdf I opened it, looked at it, and it, you know, laid out the, you know, if it's easy, you add plus one, intermediate plus two, hard add plus three, roll under your stat, go, and I'm just like, oh, cool. That's probably all I need, all I really need to know. Yeah. It's and, pretty fun. Yeah. And there definitely is uh, a lot of, a lot of space in the, the tabletop ecosystem for every kind of game. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and more and more as these years are going on, we're getting more different types of games. We're getting, you know, people who are creating like these new and interesting systems that, you know, you might not have heard of even a few years ago. And, and I think that's exciting. You know, I mean, uh, I look at something like Alice is Missing, uh, which 
you know, won all the awards and as it should, I, the idea of what you're doing in there is it's brilliant to me. And because more and more people are creating games and more and more people are coming to the hobby, like we're going to get to see some really cool stuff. And I'm excited about that. Yeah. Like tons of stuff from tons of different viewpoints all around the world. And it's, it's wonderful to see. Um, and that means more giant fish monsters to fight. Oh yeah. Yeah. We got some really <laughs> cool monsters. I mean, we had, we had really cool monsters in rocket to Russia. We've got some really, more different and cool monsters in Point Nemo as well. So you're not just fighting the same thing over and over again. Like the the main creatures called the Amphicora, right? They're like the job squad on the island. They're they're the you're they're, you're not gonna have a hard time beating them. So they they definitely pop up again in uh in Point Nemo. But you know the rest of the monsters that you're gonna run into are gonna be new and unique and exciting. Uh, so you get a different experience. Thanks. So, uh, sorry, I just keep scrolling past the, uh, the picture of the fish monster holding the, like, car door as a shield, and just, like, every thought that I have goes out of my mind, because I'm just like, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, that's, uh, that's another kind of Amphicor, I call it the Amphicor Award, and so, you know, in Rocket to Russia, there's a lot of military stuff on the island, so in the, the first adventure, um, which is available right now at Exalted Funeral, um, you are a crack commander team going to this mysterious island to do essentially a wet works job to kind of clean up a situation there and restore order to the island. So there are military bases or other things that you, you come across on the island. Uh, Point Nemo is two years later, and you're the documentary film crew. You're coming across stuff, but it's also two more years for the different creatures on the island to kind of do their thing. So what you see, uh, that's the Amphicor Ward. He's got a we call a scrap axe which is an axe formed from different like scraps of metal. I always love the idea of creatures that have shields. Like I, I grew up watching the, the Dungeons and Dragons uh, cartoon and like, you know, the, the Cavaliers got the shield, Captain America's got a shield. And like, it's always kind of cool to me to throw an obstacle at a player that isn't armor or isn't like something like, you know, they're hiding behind, but like the shield is kind of like it, it adds temporary luck points to the monster and like you could attack with it. You could use it to, to shield yourself with it. And then if you defeat the creature, the players can use it as a shield, but it's, it's actually the, the door of a Humvee that got ripped off and is being used as a shield. Nice. What's the, what's the assumed like base setting of point Nemo aside from monster Island talking like late fifties, kind of cold war ish. That's a great question. So, the island hasn't been there too long, uh, and I don't want to get too much into the lore of it because it's stuff that you're actually going to find out when you play it. But when you first hit the island, it's 2005. So this these two games take place 2005, and then point so Rockets 2005, Point Nemo's 2007. So it's modern. It it definitely is modern. Uh, but overall, the island has not been there long, and that's a, a very big point of contention and why uh, that you find out when you're you're exploring the island right on right on <laughs> yeah so you're uh <laughs> sorry i would not have guessed modern uh from from the pulp influences that's not bad don't get me wrong just uh no i totally appreciate it, it you know I, but that's the stuff I, I grew up loving you know i mean i love all different kinds of stories the idea with three two one actions that we can tell a commando story we can tell a sci-fi survival story you could do a western you could do a heist you could do you know we're doing horror next year you can do different kinds of horror uh with this system pulp noir whatever story you want to tell the the three to one action system is so easy and streamlined you can just kind of drop it into whatever kind of story you want to tell i mean if you've got like a favorite tv show like if you love i love supernatural so if i wanted to play supernatural i could run a game of supernatural just using the things that we have in here and then you figure out some monster stuff on the fly i've actually run ferris bueller's day off for <laughs> uh, some people because it's it's actually very possible with a little bit of uh adjusting on the story to run ferris bueller's day off from front to back i mean i'm sure running supernatural in this would work better than the official supernatural tabletop game you know i've never played it i've never played it because uh you know i've always run across licensed stuff and i don't think there's anything wrong with licensed stuff because obviously you can see some of the board games i have in the background are like the alien board game like i think there's a, a great thing that you can do with licensed products but 
I think up until recently where you do have these amazing other systems out like, you know, Powered by Apocalypse and um, other types of RPG systems, a lot of the older uh, licensed games that were coming out, it was trying to be like hacks of D&D or like hacks of like, you know, the generic role playing system. There's always that kind of point where you could do almost everything that you want to do, but then you hit this weird Rubicon. And you have trouble kind of crossing that, and that kind of breaks the game. So the idea with three, two, one action was that we we remove that Rubicon because it's more about telling the game runner what you want to do, and then having the scene play out. Uh, even combat in three, two, one action, you don't roll to hit. So you roll the d10, and then each weapon has uh, a damage penalty essentially. So you roll against that. So say. You know, if you're trying to punch something and it's minus six, you roll a d10, you roll seven, that means you only do one damage. And so it's easier to keep track of, whereas certain certain weapons have damage bonuses. Like, the heavier the weapon, the more you move towards a bonus. Like, so, you know, a shotgun, if you use it a certain way, will have, like, a plus two. So now you're rolling a ten and you're adding two. So it, it all scales by the weapons you're using, but you don't have to worry about, am I going to hit? you're always going to theoretically hit. If you don't do any damage, you can consider that a miss, but, you know, it's more about, you know, for instance, uh, I'll tell you, uh, the other day I was running it, and there was a creature and there was a pit. And the one person had a knife, and their friend had a rope. And so the player said to me, Hambone, I want to at-at this thing. And how could I do that? I was like, well, just make an action check. and. I gave him a penalty because he was going to dive at the creature's legs and kind of tumble and keep trying to tie the rope around the creature's legs. And the other person was drawing the creature's attention. The creature fell forward, fell in the pit. They didn't actually have to do any damage. They just outsmarted the creature. And that's what we encourage in 3 2 one Actually, we encourage teamwork, you know, finding a way to really cooperate with your fellow players to do something really cool, you know? Right, and you're not then going to sit there and be like, okay, how deep was that pit? Uh, 30 feet, okay, so it takes, you know, 1d6 for every 10 feet it fell. Um, yeah, no, it's it's dispatched. Like, maybe I'll crawl out of the pit later. Not your problem right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are movement there are movement rules, but they're light. And honestly, the way yeah. we approach it to an action is it's story and fun over physics. Um, and also the idea that everyone can do their thing. So it's not a matter of you defeat the creature just because you were the last person to hit the creature. Or like, if you have a thing you can do, you can do it and not have to worry about, well, this other character can kind of do the same thing. I happen to be further down the initiative, so I never get to actually do the thing I showed up to do, like turn undead or whatever, because, you know, Bill did that. <laughs> yeah. Uh so what have you got for like uh, fan fancy stretch goals in this uh, Kickstarter? So we we have several stretch goals uh, worked out. The first one, uh, my girlfriend is a comic book artist named Sally Canarino. She's amazing. She's uh, working on Human Remains right now. She did a Walk with Monsters, Final Girls uh, for uh, Comicsology. She's done some art for this game. So the first stretch goal is an actual artist design character sheet. Now, if you go to 321actiongames.com or you go to our uh, itch, there is a free character sheet everyone can just download. Uh, but, she, you know, what we want to do is an actual, like, special character sheet just for this adventure. And that's kind of something we, we really want to do going forward. Like, every major story that we do will have, like, a special character sheet specifically for that story. Um, so that's, well, that's one of the stretch goals. Uh, we previously for Rocket to Russia, we did monster and, and character trading cards with some uh, artist cards thrown in there as well. Uh, people love that. Uh, so that's a that's on the table again for a stretch goal. Obviously, more art. Um, the big one that we're, we would love to see happen is one of the things we used to love when we were younger, where you would buy that essentially it was a pad of character sheets to be able to tear out the character sheet from. So ultimately, the. The first goal is artist design character sheet. The final stretch goal is going to be an actual pad of 25 pull away character sheets. Uh, you know, we got to get there. We, we're in the process of funding. We are 
uh, getting ever closer to 80%. And so we have to hit that six great $6,000 goal first, and then we can, uh, we can get them stretch goals, rock and roll. And as a recording, there's, you know, 20 days left. So it should be 19 by the time this goes up. And that is, that's plenty of time. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'll tell you, I've been to sales my entire life and like, you're constantly watching that, constantly watching that total. And even though for me, yes, I can see that there's 20 days left, but it's never enough days. Like I want to try to get it done and then we can, then I can not rest, but then I can like chill a little bit and like focus on now we push towards the stretch goals, but I will feel so good. and so less anxious when the darn thing is funded, you know? And you wonderful viewer can help this man feel less anxious. Make that number go up. There's a if link anything, below. <laughs> you are helping my anxiety by clicking that link back in Point Nemo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've talked to a lot of people on here who have said that uh, the month running the Kickstarter is the most stressful of their lives. <laughs> yeah, this is my second this year. Oh. We, we, kickstarted, we kickstarted Rockets of Russia during Zine Quest. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it is super stressful. Like, I, I am very lucky because I have Sally and I've taught my best friend who does this with me. I mean, I am, I guess, more the public face of what we do because uh, I'm, I'm the one who's going to be out here doing interviews. I'm constantly posting about it, but that's kind of been my business and I've been in, in, in different forms of entertainment for for years now. So I'm used to it, but it's different now because it's not like, come see my band on like whatever night or like, come listen to my podcast. It's like, please, can I have money so we can like, you know, fund this thing and, you know, constantly posting every day and constantly trying to get it in front of people you know it's stressful it, it definitely is stressful please comrades i would like to eat and also make cool stuff yeah <laughs> and i and that's and that's the rub like i really do appreciate services like kickstarter because you know as much as it's never ideal it's never an ideal situation and stuff happens in the end of the day it's helped more ships sail into creativity by giving them a platform to get people up um, and, and get people's projects out. Some stuff that we never would have seen, you know, in the past. And sometimes you just need a hand and you have this amazing idea, but you don't have the money or the means to do it. So I, I think it's cool. I think it's a, a stressful thing, but I think it's a cool thing that there's so many people out there from all over who get the opportunity to follow their dream and to be able to, to do something cool and like, be like, now it's not in here anymore. Now here it is. Like, enjoy it. Like, I enjoyed writing because it, it meant so much to me. Right on. Yeah, no, like, there, I, I've interviewed a lot of people and a lot of stuff that I've done interviews for just would not have seen the light of day without uh, without that sweet, sweet money. Yeah, and it's different. You know, I, in a way, it's different. Like, I, I grew up playing rock and roll. I've, I've been a musician my entire life. And like when you are playing in a band and you're trying to write songs and record songs, um, it's a certain kind of insular experience because it's just how many ever members of the band there are. And you're arguing amongst yourselves trying to write these songs and practicing and doing all this stuff. And you don't really get any kind of feedback because it doesn't, unless people finally hear it at a show or you put out a record or whatever, it's only what's happening in that room in that bubble. And then at a point, you work to get to this point, and you have to do A, B, C, D, or E to get to the point where you can finally release something, and it either like happens or it doesn't happen. And then you know you have to follow it up by touring and doing other things, but it's harder to kind of get people to kind of wrap their heads around it in a lot of ways if it's not an immediate hit. RPGs has been different because you actually want to have other people involved, so you're play testing the entire time. So instead of like now it's ready to be seen by an audience. It's like, hey, here it is, warts and all. What do you think? How do you think it could be better? What could I do with this? And then, like, you kind of learn how to step outside of yourself in the creative process because now it's not so much, you know, only what I see here and what I can put down here. It's now like, ah, oh, that that does make more sense that way. And like learning how to acquiesce and, and kind of accept other people's feedback. So you you have a bigger and I think a better chance to to make something really long lasting and creative that way. Uh, so. Yeah, absolutely. And also fewer people shout play Freebird. 
It happens more than you think, man. You know, uh, I will say up until 2003, you were getting a lot of play free bird, but like from like 2003 to like 2010, 2011, it was Slayer. Slayer. <laughs> they ran in blood, you know, and like, even if bands like didn't know Slayer, they knew like, dun, 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 dun. like they knew that like opening riff, and then people were like, "Yeah," they're like, "I don't know where to go from here. I don't <laughs> listen to this stuff." Like I-, I got the tab online, I just figured it out, you know. <laughs> That's excellent. I uh, I did not know the addendum to the the classic, you know, play free bird thing. It, it kind of happened. Like it it kind of didn't happen like fast it kind of happened like gradually like it went from like free bird the slayer and like that it was just slayer and then like and then that was it and then it was like a weird time where people would like not do that anymore because enough people kind of caught on to it where it was like that's kind of jerky like it's a little bit douchey for sure (laughs) and they're never gonna play free bird like i would say 9.99 like to the decimal times out of 10 a band won't play Freebird. I've I've been in bands before where like we did we learned like the first like bit of Freebird. It, it's happened like once or twice where people were doing it and we would we just start breaking into Freebird. And when you do that, because no one thinks you're gonna do it, they don't know people don't know what to do with themselves because you're just like, oh my god, that actually worked. It's like <laughs> you know, it's like it's like you know, you throw a, a throw a quarter in a wishing well and you make a wish, then it immediately comes true. Like, that's not ever supposed to happen. But, like, you know, it, you, you get, you, you play the first, like, bunch of bars, you get to, like, the first verse, and you're like, we're not going to play Freebird. It's a seven-minute song. Like, <laughs> but dude, it, that, that'll that shut a person right up. And more often than not, they will buy a T-shirt afterwards because they they kind of feel like they owe you. <laughs> so, yeah. And who's going to notice if you didn't play the whole thing? It's seven minutes long. Nobody knows that. Yeah, yeah. No, no one is ready for Freebird. You know, I I went to a, a buddy of mine. He had a his brother worked for a company that had like a a box at like Yogi Berra Stadium in Montclair, and they would get concerts like all the time. And uh, you know, one day he calls me up. I was working down the hill at a bar, and he's like, "Hambone, what are you doing?" I was like, oh, "I'm getting off of work in like thirty minutes." He's like, "Get in your car, drive right up, give your name up there." We're going to see Cheap Trick. Now, I love Cheap Trick. Cheap Trick's one of my favorite bands. So I was like, wait, just just hang up. And he's like, come here. And he's like, and you're going to go to this box. And he's like, free beer and free food. Just come. And so I went and I saw Cheap Trick for free at this stadium. And it was awesome. It was awesome. Like, awesome. I mean, this is, God, it's almost 20 years ago at this point. But then, like, a few months later, he calls me out of the blue game. He's like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm getting to work in 30 minutes. He's like, do you want to see Leonard Skinner? <laughs> no. <laughs> but is it the same deal as last time where we got a box, a clean bathroom, free hot dogs and beer? And he's like, yes. And I was like, then I would love to see Leonard Skinner. And I got up there and, <clears throat> you know, I don't, I don't really remember a lot of it. Uh, again, this is almost two decades ago, but I do remember like, there's that moment where like, if you're chanting play free bird, it's the only acceptable place to do that because eventually they have to play free bird. Like it's in the contract. And so like, you know, people chant play free bird like the entire time. But then when the band took the stage, they just, they just stop because they knew, they knew it was coming. <laughs> uh, but then there's like a point where everything gets quiet and it's like the calm before the storm. And you're like, and mind you for, for those watching at home um, who may not be familiar with Leonard Skinner, most of the band died in a plane crash like a long time ago. So this is like the few guys that are left and their cousins of the original members. So it's 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 Leonard Skinner. And it's actually been they've been Leonard Skinner longer than the actual original Leonard Skinner was a band. But but still, it's it's the rel- the rel- relatives of Leonard Skinner. So there's this like weird, like calm before like the storm happens when you know they're going to play Freebird, And inevitably, and, it's, and now at live, it's an 11 minute version, by the way, but inevitably when they break into Freebird, everyone gets like real quiet and they know when to pop and the whole crowd pops. Everyone's losing their mind because now you're at a Leonard Skinner concert. They're playing friggin' Freebird. Uh It's kind of a weirdly beautiful moment, but the, the rest of it wasn't so great. <laughs> But at least there were free hot dogs and beer. 
there were. And I got my money's worth. <laughs> it, those two things make a lot of things better, in my personal experience. Is there a, is there a buffet? <laughs> is it free? Yeah, I'm the, I've definitely gone... Yeah, I've definitely gone to work parties like that. Are you giving me food? Sweet, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, granted, it's it's been like many years. I don't drink anymore, but now it's like, where what's going on? Where are we going? Is there going to be food? And now, now you're speaking my language. Now that's it. I went to a party. I went to a Halloween party. It was a great spread. It was like soft pretzels and everything. And I was like, Jack, <laughs> you know. And Point Nemo is absolutely the kind of adventure that you could eat hot dogs and drink beer while playing. It's very true. Yeah. And I or guess... so any, any kind of beverage you like. Mm-hmm. And I guess you can listen to... to <laughs> and I guess you can listen to Freebird if you want. You know, I, I almost feel like obligated. Like, at, There's got to be like a point in an adventure where it's got to come up, but... <laughs> but now, now you got me thinking about it. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta squeeze Freebird in one of these. It's... It is absolutely the the basis of an adventure where you have to like break into an animal testing facility and release all of the birds they've been testing on. Well, there you go. Adventure writes itself. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, and, and looking back at it, like you know, I, I I've got a goddaughter, she, and she she's four now. She really did inspire a lot of this game because, you know, during the major part of the pandemic i was just upstairs a lot hanging out watching her watch like educational program things like sesame street and whatever so a lot of what we do where you know it seems like a broad generalization but most people can count to 10 and and really work with simple addition subtraction so the idea is it's a 10-sided die so your stat is a minimum of two maximum of nine so there's always a chance for failure and always a chance for success and, and if there's a penalty or a bonus, it's going to be based off of one, two, three. So we keep it simple. Uh, however, uh, getting back to the free bird thing, uh, I watched her watching Sesame Street. And like, I was thinking about like when I was a kid and I saw Follow That Bird and like the, the Sesame Street movie. And I'm like, man, how did they not put free bird in that? It's a giant yellow bird. And he's trying to escape and get home. Like, you know, I don't know. But uh yeah, <laughs> give me good. Three hit me talk about free bird, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's cool, and that's why the system is simple. And like, one of the things that we do is instead of using hit points, we use luck. So when you run out of luck, you die. And so if say back to the thing we were mentioning before about like swinging on a jungle vine over a pit of lava, if you're jumping to the next vine and you miss, like if you roll your action check and you blow the roll, like say if you have an action stat, of, action stat of seven and you roll a 10, you can spend three of your luck points, essentially steal some of your own life and push your luck to make it to that next vine and survive. And it's a risk reward thing because you're like, well, I know I can spend three luck points and I can make it. Or I can see what happens when I fall from a high up location into a pit of lava. Risk reward, you know? I really like the very uh very concrete risk reward there yeah like the resource management i've definitely played games where like you have those kinds of resources but nobody ever uses them because what if i need it later yeah i, I mean i i ran one the other day uh ran point Nemo the other day and at the end one of the players was like uh i was down to like three luck points because i'd blown so many rolls and i'd pushed so much of my luck that like i i anything that hit me i would have died but you know you've made it this far and at the end of every episode you're gonna roll like a d10 to get luck points back and you, there's other things you can do throughout the game to get luck points back and you know so there's a chance you would have been just fine but like from where this monster is to the ladder you need to get out a lot can happen when you only have three luck points <laughs> and the next thing you know you might be getting dragged off into the dark Deep depths below. Point Nemo. There's yeah, there's a lot going on, on the island, man. You might not be wrong. <laughs> there's also a flaming chainsaw, by the way. I feel like we're obligated to bring up the flaming chainsaw. <laughs> Every everybody everybody loves that. It's one of like my favorite things in the world. Like part of the best things that I could do with like writing these games and, and is well one it's is writing with my best friend 
it's, it's the best experience to be able to work on things with him again. The other part of it is that like, I get to like hire people to draw cool sh stuff. Like, you know, I've always been a person who's people have helped me follow my dreams. So for me to be able to find an artist who's like, I just want to draw monsters and be like, you, here's money, draw monsters. And like, and see what comes out is like pretty amazing with the, the chainsaw thing. My buddy, cheese Hasselberger, who did the uh, illustrations and the rule book, he's done a, bit, a bunch of illustrations and, uh, rocket to Russia. He did all the weapon des weapon design for me, and I was like, "So one of the special weapons you find on the island, you know, I love horror movies. Uh, I don't know if you could tell by the the accoutrement in my apartment, but uh, I love the movie The Thing and like the Kurt Russell with the flamethrower, Night of the Creeps, uh, girl in the prom dress with the the homecoming dress with the flamethrower. So flame, I, I was like, I had to get a flamethrower in the game, and then you know, Evil Dead, love, 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 and I'm like, why well, gotta get a chainsaw in the game and uh, my buddy Levi Combs from Planet X Games, he's really been extremely helpful with kind of like giving me advice on running Kickstarters and, and kind of breaking into this avenue of the RPG industry. So, you know, I wanted to do something cool to, to really say thank you for that. So like, you know, flamethrower, chainsaw, peanut butter, chocolate, two great tastes that go together. And so uh, I named it the Brother Levi Flamesaw. It's one of the most destructive weapons in the entire game. You find it um at some point in the game and uh you know you only get four inventory slots uh because I, we try to keep it simple so like this takes up three of your inventory slots that being said it's a flamethrower with a chainsaw attached to it you can both Whoa. cut wood for a fighter fire and start a fire yeah it's yeah. the swiss army knife of giant horrible terrifying weapons Oh, it's it's good, and there's a, there's a few other cool weapons in there as well. We got a grappling hook, and I mean it's not really a spoiler because you see us see me posting about it on social media. But uh, Sally and I were watching Gravity Falls again, and you know, Mabel had a grappling hook, and I was like, God, you know, growing up watching Batman, 1989 Batman, I remember seeing it in theaters, uh, Batman the animated series, like the idea of the grappling gun. I'm like, I got to figure this out. I have to have like a grappling gun in this game because like who wouldn't want to use a grappling gun? And then there's some other weapons in there as well that I don't want to really spoil, but oh, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah, you can pick one thing from the shop: grappling hook. Yeah, well, yeah, it's got lots of different uses. So it's uh, it's a good pick. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've definitely had people who were fighting stuff, and they they found like oil can gas big big drums of oil and gas and whatever and uh you know the the idea is when you want to do combat you can you can plan it all out together you're essentially building the scene so the one person was like i have this grappling gun uh, can i shoot it across and grab that garbage the gas can thing and pull it over towards the monster and then my buddy shoot it and i was like yeah just roll roll this thing and you know, we don't want to make you roll more than you have to in three, two, one action. But like, you know, it was definitely like a very specific thing that needed to be done. And they did it. And the can comes flying over towards the monster. And their friend's like, smile, you son of a bitch. And then they blew the monster up. And then the, the grappling hook came back and they're on to the next one. So that is one of my favorite things about tabletop games is that kind of like environmental combat. You, you you let me blow something up or, like, knock a catwalk down onto something. It's a good session for me. I'm a simple yeah, man. Exactly. You know, and that's kind of where I came from, too, with, you know, me and George trying to come up with these rules. It was like, and and again, I don't think there's really any wrong style of play. I think that sometimes it's hard to find the right people to play with because, you, when you're in an RPG group, you really need to be on the same page as your players and your dungeon master or game runner or whatever. But, you know, me and George, we would be, like, playing these games and, like, often being told no when we want to do these, like, crazy harebrained ideas. And we didn't want that to be the kind of experience that people had playing 3 2 one action. We wanted you to be able to, you know, if you want to do the, the, the thing with the grappling gun and the gas can, like, you could be able to do that. If you're like, I need to, like, flip this table and hide behind while people are shooting at me or, like, you know, jump out this window or I want to climb this tree and, like, hang upside down and try to get my... You can do that. Like, you just... You're going to roll for it in certain circumstances, but, like, it's more fun when you let people say yes and, and then you take it from there. So George and I, like, 
we we came up with this system. It started out as a almost like an OSR, you know, general role playing D hundred different dices for every weapon. And you know, I went to him and he was like, "Well, you really want this to be simple?" And I was like, "Yeah." And he's like, "Why don't you drop the zero?" And he's like, "We'll just do it off a D ten." And so we we found a way to craft the entire system together, doing it off of a single D ten. In his words, it's elegant in its simplicity, uh, and and he's not wrong. You know, he's sheer elegance and simplicity. Yeah, one hundred percent right, man. And like, you know, I get like, you know, when you're when you're in a creative partnership, you get a little strong sometimes about some stuff. But like, I've kind of learned that like when he kind of pitches these ideas, I'm like, ah, oh, he's right. I'm just gonna. He's right because I I know it. I know he's he sat there with his delicious brain and he's like, this. He's like this. This is why it's going to work better. And I'm like, oh, he's right, and he's right. And like you know, the luck point idea was his, like switching over from hit points to luck points, which was to me one of the things that really is like the the thing that makes the system work is that like you're in a movie, you're in a movie, you're in a, a TV show, you're in an adventure, you're going to push your luck. And so you know, he was like, let's move away from hit points, let's do luck points, um, guts penalties though and guts checks is something though i'm really proud of because something i i didn't really see very well represented in games globally is that like how do you translate like physical harm and things that make you bleed versus like physical harm when it comes to like your overall composition um so when you have your stats you got action brains brawn cool charm and guts luck points are spent on things that make you bleed your guts checks that you're going to have to make to see if you incur an ongoing guts penalty is like you twist your ankle you blow out your knee you you know eat a bad burrito you got a really bad hangover you know you bunk your elbow and it's the funny bone and it's not funny like that kind of thing you're going to roll your guts check because although these aren't things that will kill you per se they're going to really inhibit your activity. So, um, you know, if you've ever, you know, gone to work with a really bad headache, you know, how hard is it to concentrate on what you're doing? So if you fail your guts check, you can uh, incur, you will incur a ongoing guts penalty. And you could be bleeding from the luck points. You could be hurting your body physically from the guts thing. And it could be a foot race to death because if you incur three ongoing guts penalties, all your stats drop by one, and it truly becomes more challenging for you to do the things you want to do. If you get four guts penalties, you die. So there's there's definitely two different ways you can die in this game. Both things you can come back from, battlefield medicine, first aid kits. Like You can actually, if you know you're getting close to death with your guts penalties, you can spend five luck points to reverse one of your guts penalties. So, you know, there, there's, there's little tricks, there's ways around everything, but... You know, the guts penalty idea and George's luck point idea, you know, really solidified the game for a lot of people and, and gave them the kind of real adventuring, like cinematic experience that they were looking for. And me too. So pumped. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Uh, finally, there is a good way to simulate uh, the effects of spending a night eating free hot dogs and drinking free beer all night. <laughs> yeah, I did. I definitely failed my guts check after that Leonard Sinner concert. I tell you, <laughs> did, not, did not feel good that Sunday morning, man. <laughs> but yeah, uh, this sounds like a ton of fun. Uh, is there any, any anything else you'd like to highlight while you're here? You know, um, one of the things that was really important to us from the start was um, we wanted to be uh, inclusive and not exclusive with the way that we get the game out there to people. Uh, obviously it would be nice to like do deluxe versions and what everything, and that'd be awesome. But uh, we always want to kind of come in at a price point that is accessible for people. So, you know, we're going to make hard copies this time, which is going to be like super cool. But they're still going to be like, you know, reasonably priced. Um, we always want the rules to be available for free for everybody anytime. So, you know, we are going to have them on our itch. We're going to have them like a link from them on our website. Like if you want to learn what 321 Match is all about, download the rules. You know, if you can't buy Rocket to Russia, well, run your own adventure for your friends using these rules. I guarantee you'll be able to do it. Um, we also like took into consideration that everyone learns differently. So, you know, the PDFs for like Rocket to Russia, the rule book, Point Nemo, they're all going to be reader friendly. 
the way the books are structured and the way the books look, they're easy to read for people who are going to be reading them um, in their hands on paper. I am not a person myself who does good with books, like reading books and learning things out of books. Like I'll, I'll get the, I'll, I'll get the broad strokes. I will, I'll figure it out, but like, I'm not going to really read something cover to cover. So it was important for us to write rules that could easily be digested um, and a rule set that is going to be easy for people to get. I wanted to take it a step further, though, because, again, not everyone learns the same way. So right now for free, if you go to 321actiongames.com, uh, you click the little Bandcamp logo, the little, little baby logo. I think it's on the top now, little circle logo. Um, there's a free audiobook version of uh, Rock to Rush out there. You could actually download it. It'll, it'll try to get you to donate money, and we will take your money if you want to give us money. But if you don't, that's cool, too. You could download the whole thing for free. I've read the thing from cover to cover. So if you learn by listening, put it on your car. I, I've got a pretty dulcet tones in my voice and uh, you can learn how to play three, two, one action like that. So we try to make it as uh, accessible for everyone who'd want to get involved in playing three, two, one action. Um, I'm going to record a point Nemo audio books, probably not going to come out for like six months after the game drops because it is a lot of work recording an audio book. Uh, I got to reconfigure a couple things and add a couple things uh, to it, but uh, probably in January, the rule book will be out in audiobook format on Bandcamp as well. 100% free. Play our game. You're going to have fun playing our game. That is fantastic. And yeah, uh, if you look in the description below this lovely video, or possibly the comment, or probably both, um, there are links to these things. Uh, you know, the Kickstarter, the, the Bandcamp page, all that fun stuff. Uh, you should back this product. It looks really cool. You can beat it, beat up a giant fish monster who is holding a Humvee's door. <laughs> yeah, we got a uh, fish monster. We got shark monsters. We got leeches. We got uh, other stuff that I'm not going to say because I really want you to kind of experience it. And there's pictures that we haven't put up uh, online when we're promoting the game yet. Uh, you know, it was also kind of important to us to make the characters all have different backgrounds. Um, I think it's important that everyone has the opportunity and it may not happen in every game, but like try to show different types of people at your table and in the game, like everyone's cool, man. Everyone, everyone can have a good time. If we just kind of like say, Hey, look, we're all here. We're all doing different things. You know, we got characters from all different countries around the world. We've got people who don't necessarily look like me. Um, and that's great. Like it's just, it adds, it adds to the, overall better experience for everybody so you know we always want to have kind of a cool group of characters from like diverse backgrounds that can also do different things so if you're playing one character you're not necessarily going to have your special ability cross over with a different character so if you have a thing that you do you get to have your hero moment you know you get to like to to show up and not go home not having done your thing that you've been waiting all night to do like but it didn't come around to you. Like you can do it. We give everyone the opportunity to to be the hero the way that they want to be the hero. Right on. Well, John, it's been great having you on. Thank you. I had a blast talking with you, man. Same to you. And uh, for those of you watching at home, yeah, you know, like, subscribe to the channel, all that fun stuff, and also go back to Kickstarter. Give this man your Please. money. Yes. <laughs> Help lessen my anxiety. Definitely. If you don't do anything else please go download the rule set to three to one action. You're going to have an absolute blast with it. If you like what you see, you had a fun time listening to this conversation, boogie on down to Kickstarter, please back point Nemo. You're going to have a blast playing point Nemo with your friends. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.